All right. Uh, hi, and um, welcome everyone to our final seminar in the Water Resources Research Center Spring Seminar Series. This week we have Randall Wakamoto and Lauren Roth Benu talking about stormwater management on Oahu. Um, so to introduce our speakers first, uh, Randall Wakamoto is the program administrator for the City and County of Honolulu Stormwater Quality Division within its Department of Facility Maintenance. Randall's responsibilities involve administering the city's stormwater management program, including coordinating with the various city departments to ensure compliance under the Federal Clean Water Act requirements. Lauren Roth Fenu is the founder and CEO of 3R Water Inc. that develops software and data platforms to support municipal green stormwater infrastructure programs and is the founding principal of Roth Ecological Design um, and that provides integrated water resource management planning and green infrastructure design. Oh, thanks, Carrie. And hopefully my internet connection is, is okay for me to get through this. But uh, as Carrie mentioned, um, I'm Randall Wakamoto and just wanna thank all of you for giving us this opportunity for presenting uh, just a glimpse of what the future here at the city and county of Honolulu of what we see um, you know, things that currently is happening, but also what we kind of want to envision the future of where we need to get to. And part of it will be kind of focused on presenting what is referred to as a stormwater utility, which is basically a funding mechanism um, in order to um, support the, you know, various aspects of stormwater. And for those of you that are maybe in the field or at least somewhat familiar, um, you know, stormwater does encompass a lot of things, you know, and I'll try to touch on a little bit of it. Um, I'll just kind of give a little bit of a heads up that I do have quite a bit of slides and I'm going to just kind of breeze through it real quickly. So some of them, as you'll see, there's going to be some, you know, a lot of text and photos and images, but, you know, I'll kind of just glen um, glance over them and just spend a few seconds on each one of them. Um, I think it's more important that, you know, we kind of want to make sure that we give um, Lauren uh, a good chance to present, you know, who we're working in partnership with um, a lot of the things where you can actually start seeing the benefits and why um, things like green stormwater infrastructure really are important. And what we kind of envision as being the direction that uh, for the city and county of Honolulu, especially is where we're heading towards. So I'll just kind of give a little um, little background. And I think a lot of you folks in the water programs kind of are somewhat familiar with this, you know, where you see some of these things happening throughout the island, uh, things like sediment, dirt, uh, trash, debris, oils, and other chemicals. Um, you know, this all kind of happens where when it rains, it sheet flows off of a, a lot of these properties. It gets into the into the roadways where it goes into the storm drains. And that ultimately gets into our streams and into our inertial waters where it affects the coral reefs, as well as a lot of the, uh, the, the fish habitats and things that do live in it. Um, so that's why it's very important that we need to take care of the land, you know, because what happens on the land directly affects our water, which we do uh, cherish and want to make sure that we're preserving. Other impacts you can see here in these photos are things like climate change, uh, where you're starting to see more frequent um, flooding incidences in low-lying areas uh, because in some cases they're tidally influenced so water is starting to pop up to the line and coming up through the storm drains uh, causing some of these kind of problems in um, certain areas like you can see here in Mapuna Puna on the left. Um, other things are like your aging infrastructure where the, um, the actual storm drains themselves are starting to fail because they've been in place for 50 years plus and starting to run the course of their life cycle um, and that that ends up becoming a much more costly effort in order to replace it. So we need to make sure that we're staying on top of being able to repair a lot of this aging infrastructure. And then when it comes to flood mitigation, you know, it's things like having to uh, maintain a lot of the streams. Uh, here are some examples on the Kanioe side, on the windward side, where you can see there's a lot of debris, a lot of trees and big boulders and being able to remove a lot of that in order to allow the free flowing of water so it doesn't contribute to a lot of flooding. You know, here on this island, we rely heavily on these streams in order to convey water from the top of the mountain down to the bottom. So we need to be able to maintain those. Uh, this is real quick. I won't go through all these numbers, but what, uh, the bottom line is that for this island, there's a significant amount of infrastructure. 
um, things that, you know, miles of pipes, culverts, uh, there's over 100 streams that the city is responsible for maintaining, you know, segments of streams. And, you know, being able to stay on top of it does take a lot of resources and effort. And it's not just one particular department in our department facility maintenance, but it kind of crosses over many different departments of the city. And that's where our stormwater quality division, you know, really is put in place to kind of administer a lot of the efforts. One is to comply with the permits but also to work with a lot of these agencies in order to ensure that they're doing what their responsibilities are. Here we have kind of a busy um, slide where you can see currently what the city is right now doing. A lot of it you can see in the left in blue is the things that demonstrate how we comply with the Clean Water Act um, you know, under those permits that issued through the State Department of Health. So we have monitoring, volunteer activities, maintaining our infrastructure, things like that. But also on the right hand side, we also have things that we're, we're having to replace a lot of that aging infrastructure, like I mentioned, and maintaining a lot of the streams and being able to install things that could help to prevent a lot of the pollution from getting into the water. But as you can see, we need to do a lot more. And that's where we can, we can anticipate that the regulatory requirements under that Clean Water Act is gonna continue to get more and more stringent requiring us to do even more inspections and doing more enforcement and more outreach. Uh, in addition to that, like I just mentioned, that having to do a lot more replacing of our aging infrastructure, and you can see there's a big gap on that where we need to do a lot more. And the same thing with maintaining a lot of our streams where we're only able to do a certain percentage of that, but we need to be able to get to all of those streams. And in addition to that, what we're anticipating is that we're gonna have to start doing a lot more green infrastructure because that is really where we can see a lot of the direct benefits. So in order to kind of um, you know, project and figure out how we're gonna be able to stay on top of all of these issues, both from the regulatory side and but more, uh, more importantly on the maintenance and replacement side, is that what we're proposing at the city is a, establishing a stormwater utility. And what that essentially entails is uh, it's a funding mechanism, like I mentioned, in order to provide the services for the whole entire island of Oahu in order to maintain and operate that whole um, complex system, like I talked about. So we've been doing this study over the last three years, starting in 2019, and really what to look into what the feasibility and ability to establish this stormwater utility. And we have a dedicated website you can see here at the bottom at stormwaterutilityoahu.org, where you can get a lot more information uh, of what I'll try to cover. So how does a stormwater utility work? Where it's basically, basically like any other utility, like your water water supply, just like your wastewater, uh, electricity is a fee for uh, a certain service, and that fee must be correlated to the work that is being provided for stormwater management. Um, you know, what as part of what we're proposing is that all properties pay a proportional share, and that even includes the federal government. Uh, and this has been established all across the country. So there's more than 2,000 cities across the country that have done something similar to what we're proposing. And you can see here on the right is the way that we're proposing it is based on the total amount of impervious area. And that's how that proportional share comes into play because the more impervious area, like the areas in blue, where it's like your rooftop, your driveways, your hard surfaces, that's where the fee comes into play versus your landscaping and grass areas, which water can soak into the ground. That's not what the fee would be accounting for. It would actually disregard that part of it because it actually directly is in alignment of what the goals of, in order to get more water into the ground, keeping it on people's properties and not necessarily put, shedding it off and putting it straight out into the ocean. So with the utility, all properties pay. So it includes shopping centers, federal facilities, like I mentioned, state city facilities, as well as any public and private uh, uh, schools, as well as condominiums, high rises and residential properties. With a stormwater utility, there would be more certainty as far as the funding, because now you can, you know, there's something that you can rely on that is going to be always there. Um, it provides more transparency because we can actually see what comes in and what gets actually what's being spent for that. Uh, currently right now with the city is all of its stormwater programs typically are funded through the property taxes, which goes into a general fund. Uh, so that's shared amongst all the city departments, whether it's police, fire, emergency management services, parks, all of those are tapping into that general fund. So of course you can imagine it gets kind of difficult in order to um, anticipate what the budget's gonna be in the future because you never know what's gonna happen 
And so it's on a year to year basis. In that kind of situation, you can't really do any of that long range planning. In addition to that, we can't really tap into other for sources of funding like federal grants because we're not sure if we're gonna be able to provide the match, which a lot of these federal grants require. Um, you know, so that's why what we're doing is with the utility, we would be able to do more proactive programming, being able to replace a lot of the aging infrastructure like our pipes and storm drains, um, being able to get out and maintaining our streams and then being able to install a lot more of those um, uh, green infrastructure like I talked about in all of the different neighborhoods. I won't really necessarily go to all of this, but you can see that there is a tier structure we were proposing as part of the utility, and you can see it kind of bases it upon the total amount of impervious area. So the more impervious area, the higher the fee, uh, and it basically breaks it down within those different categories. So of course, at the bottom would be the largest properties with the biggest amount of impervious area. So that would likely be like your shopping centers and other bigger properties. With the utility, we would also propose things like credits and rebates. You know, so what we want to do is incentivize certain behaviors in order to encourage people to put things that allow water to go into the ground, thereby helping to replenish a lot of our groundwater supplies, also providing some of the water quality benefits. And so in that situation, somebody could actually reduce the amount of the fee by digging up some of their hard surfaces, like their driveways, or maybe taking the downspouts from their roof and redirecting it into a landscaped area. In that kind of situation, they will get a credit. It would offset the amounts that they're currently being billed. And then that would be as a sort of a reduction in the payments. In addition to that, you could also get rebates. So these are usually for that one-time installation. So that things like if you were to put in like a rain barrel, for instance, or a rain garden on your property, you could actually possibly qualify for a rebate and like a sort of an upfront um, payment for that one-time um, situation of when it's installed. And of course, what we want to also account for is recognizing that all households, um, you know, that, you know, are different in terms of their financial situations. And so we want, would want to be able to incorporate some type of a uh, sort of a uh, reduction uh, for those that are economically challenged and then proposing some type of a hardship provision. So that's something that we've looked into a lot and we've had a lot of conversations with our stakeholders in order to um, support what that could look like. So this is kind of like a sort of a map, a sort of a um, kind of a timeline. As I mentioned, we started in 2019 when we started first looking into this issue of a stormwater utility. Uh, we launched our website. We established what is referred to as a stakeholder advisory group, uh, which is comprised of all the various different type of business organizations, environmental groups, all the neighborhood board districts, as well as uh, engineering communities, uh, land developers, um, other things that have different interests uh, that share um, different ideas. We present it to them, they give us the feedback, you know, so this even includes the faith-based community. Uh, so there's a, you know, a wide ranging um, number of people that are on that board and or that stakeholder advisory group, and it's really been helpful to get us to this point. Um, starting in 2020, we started to do some of the um, community meetings, um, but that's when um, COVID hit. And so we had to convert it to a virtual type meetings format. And then in 2021, as things were slowly starting to um, open up again, we started to get into all the neighborhood boards. So we presented both in March and April, as well as in September, October at all the neighborhood boards. So those are about 36 neighborhood boards. So we went to each one of them kind of highlighted the fact of what this utility, what it would provide and what are some of the benefits. And then from there, you know, of course, getting all the feedback from the community. And then the hope was that we were gonna actually introduce something in 2022, you know, so to actually introduce a bill to city council to establish the utility. However, at this time, um, you know, like what you can see here is that we were hoping to be able to then be able to establish the actual utility in 2022. And the idea was that in 2024 was when we were gonna actually start collecting the fees. However, at this point in time, um, you know, there has been some challenges economically, I know for households as well as businesses, um, primarily because of COVID, but more recently because of the whole situation with um, now having to look at raising property tax, I mean, raising property values, um, as well as for things like your, um, you know, we're starting to see things like inflation starting to pop up where you could see at the pump that cost of gas is going up and all the cost of services and goods are going up as well. 
So at this point in time, I think with the city council, we knew that there was some hesitancy on wanting to adopt a new fee, um, you know, because of the, the current situation. And so we're reevaluating that and thinking of when that might be that, that timing of when we introduce that bill. So that's something that we're currently looking at different type of alternatives. And at this point in time, we've kind of put a temporary pause, you know, but we're hoping that maybe later this year, there could be an opportunity to present that bill. So what's to come, you know, for the re remaining part of this year in 2022 and going into 2023 and beyond, uh, you know, so we took a step back and obviously recognized that, you know, as far as the utility, maybe it does be put on pause, but what we wanted to be able to do is start working on some of that more long range planning, being able to do things that where we can actually start to express where we are going to be putting in our our investments in order to replace some of our aging infrastructure, putting in more green infrastructure, being able to establish partnerships, things like that, and being able to come up with um, certain strategies. And so what we've been working on this year in 2022 is this strategic plan. So you can see like this um, on the right, it's kind of like this kind of umbrella where, you know, looking at different things, whether it's for drainage purposes, flooding, mitigation, workforce development, asset renewal, replacement, and really coming up with this strategic plan, which is the first step in coming up with what is the mission what are the vision, what are some of those goals and strategies, and then having to put all that together that would then lead into what we're referring to as a more comprehensive stormwater master plan. And that's gonna take place next year. And a lot of that effort is gonna um, be using, what we're targeting is to be using these recent um, ARPA funds, the federal ARPA funds. So this is the monies that the federal government gave all to all the states, and then it passed down to the counties and being able to do more of that planning, like we mentioned, you know, so that's where we're looking to tap into that resource. And the idea is that then we could actually start creating these strategies, putting it down in terms of the um, functional plans of where we need to start building, um, you know, replacement plans in certain communities and being able to prioritize that and being more transparent so that way we can kind of see over the long term, whether it's 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, even 100 years, where do we need to put all of our resources in? And in addition to that, we need to also look at um, what is a like a more comprehensive workforce development strategy, you know, because currently in the city, and I'm sure a lot of companies, as well as here at the, you know, at the University of Hawaii, there's challenges with hiring, you know, qualified staff. And so we need to be able to come up with a strategy of how we can get people into the workforce because we're gonna to have to be able to plan, design, construct, but also be able to maintain it. And that's really the big key part of it is being able to maintain it over the long term. And so this is all gonna be part of that stormwater master plan that we're gonna be developing over the next year. And that we're kind of really excited to see how what comes out of that. Tying into all of that, we also know that, as I mentioned, it's really the heavy emphasis is going to be putting in more green stormwater infrastructure. You can see here examples of throughout the island, especially here on the leeward side out in Nanakuli and Waianae, where it's very dry, but still you can see where it can actually support things like green infrastructure. And it you know, includes things like trees, plants, you know, native plants and grasses and brushes and things. And it just helps to beautify the community, but it provides that extra benefit of treating the water, filtering it through the natural landscape, and also providing some of the more um, aesthetic um, benefits. Uh, in addition to also, there's a whole number of benefits that you get with green stormwater infrastructure, like the heat island effect, as well as being able to you know, recharge some of our groundwater supplies. And it doesn't necessarily mean that green stormwater infrastructure is only limited to just plants and grasses. You can see on the left, is that it also includes things like permeable pavements where you're allowing water to flow directly through the pavers and then getting it down into the ground rather than just shedding it off and going directly into the storm drain. So you're providing some of that additional benefits to capture, treat it and store the water. So here at the city and county of Honolulu, what we have is in place is what is referred to as um, standards. Uh, it's, it was basically developed back in 1984 as this Department of Public Works standards, um, both the standard details as well as the specification. And that applies to all the um, construction, new development, as well as redevelopment. So when they're putting in a new subdivision, for instance, they're gonna refer to these standards. Uh, but over that time, it hasn't been really updated um, significantly. 
And so there was a real big push, especially on our department, within our Department of Facility Maintenance to update those standards. And so you can see here in 2020, we took that effort to actually go through all the different standards to try to incorporate new technologies, new designs, and getting it to the point where at least it's something more up to the current codes and um, requirements. And so we address things like drainage. So these are like your catch basins, your storm drain pipes, your storm drain culverts, um, manholes and things like that. Um, we also address transportation. So like sidewalks and street lights and traffic signals. And in addition to that, what we did was created this whole new section that wasn't existing in 1984, which is focused on green stormwater infrastructure, like I just mentioned. So we have a whole new section just dedicated to this green stormwater infrastructure where it provides those details that contractors, designers use as a reference tool in order to you know, help streamline it and making sure that the city or whatever developer or designer is following is something that the city would you know, basically accept. So this is one example of a typical green stormwater infrastructure detail for a vegetated biofilter. Uh, so you can see here where it talks about what the different um, layouts are, the depths, some of the depths, as well as what needs to be done as far as what a contractor would be following. And then, you know, an example of that is like the tree box filter. You can see on the right-hand side where it's one that was installed at a McDonald's in Kahala. So it's just more like a box you can see. And then it has like a root ball as well as the tree stump inside of it. And then it, what it acts is, is a filter. So water flows into it. It allows the water to uh, naturally get filtered to the, the, the plant roots as well as the soils and other things in order to uh, provide those direct benefits. And this is just another example of one that is for a bioretention basin. Um, you can see on the right some photos, examples of like in the Alawai, Alawai neighborhood, bar, neighborhood Board Park, uh, where they have like a bioretention um, area, as well as a biofiltration swale that was installed at the Honolulu Police Station out in Kalihi. So I just wanted to wrap up that, you know, what we mentioned was I talked about is really trying to establish more partnerships, uh, being able to tap into other federal sources of funding. And this is actually one example of one that we're hoping to be able to do in the future. And this is really directly tied to the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where we've had conversations with the working with the Water Resources Research Center. Um, we've been working with a um, uh, an individual, her name is Dr. Amanda Cording, and she kind of specializes in biofiltration, rain gardens, and things. And what we've been talking about is putting in together this pilot project where it's focused on developing what is going to be referred to as like a living laboratory that allows for students at Holmes Hall, which is mostly comprised of engineers, in order to come up with different designs. And the idea would be to direct a lot of the runoff coming from the city portion, which is along Dole Street, and then having that water going into the landscaped area onto the, um, the University of Hawaii's property and being able to come up with these modular type units in order to monitor the benefits of these different type of bowel region, uh, green stormwater infrastructure installations and designs. So this is something that we're talking about where um, using the storm drains coming from the roadway, directing it into it so that you can kind of create a real life situation of what the direct benefits of these um, layouts. And so this is just some preliminary um, you know, field reconnaissance work, looking at the different drains you can see here along East West Road, uh, but more importantly, along also on Dole Street and being able to get that water into the adjacent property you can see on the University of Hawaii side. Uh, so we've had some preliminary discussions. I know we've talked to the, uh, dean of, um, the Dean of Engineering and he's very supportive of this idea. He's kind of put us in contact with the facility side and now it's a matter of trying to see if there is an opportunity to kind of put together a grant package that could qualify for some kind of federal funds, in which case the city could then come up with a design in order to redirect these flows into the property, build this living laboratory so that then it could be turned over to the University of Hawaii to allow for the students to be able to come up with different type of designs and layouts. Okay. So this is just another example of where the storm drains are and how that water would essentially need to get onto the adjacent property, right? So rather than going directly into the drain, going out into Manoa Stream and then going out into the ocean, we would intercept that water and be able to filter and treat that. So this is just, again, another example of what 
preliminarily was thinking, but again, this is just still at the initial stages of the conversation. And so we're continuing to have those conversations with the University of Hawaii. Uh, these are just some resources I just want to direct your attention to. So this is where we have our stormwater utility study I mentioned and where we have all the information as far as the, the plans for having to establish a fee for all properties where credits could come into play, uh, but also other things like the cost of services and what the cost that the city is currently spending and then what was the projection of where we need to get to in the future. Uh, we also have guidance for homeowners if they ever are interested in installing green infrastructure on their properties, like putting in the, uh, you know, redirecting their downspouts or putting in a rain barrel or whatever, a rain garden. And then, of course, the last one is our website where you can get any kind of information as far as uh, our program, which focuses a lot on water quality and as well as on complying with those permit requirements under the Clean Water Act. So this is at cleanwaterhonolulu.com. And at the bottom, you can see there's other resources. If you ever have an issue, you can always go to the city's 311 app. Uh, there's also an environmental concern line that you can call, as well as sending an email to, uh, to this complaints at honolulu.gov, which would eventually get to us. And then, of course, we also have a, a clean stream hotline where if there's any issues in terms of what's happening in the streams and having to be able to maintain it, there is a hotline established for that. So I, this time, I just wanted to thank you again for giving us this opportunity. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Lauren Rock, Benny, who's going to talk a little bit more about some of the opportunities that we're partnering with them, but also how they're working with different nonprofits and organizations. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Randall. Um, and thank you, WRC, for inviting us here today. I'm just going to put this set up. Um, and I think Randall gave a really great background about uh, where the city's going and also some background about green stormwater infrastructure. And so I'm going to kind of um, take the baton there and move this forward and talk a little bit about Follow the Drop, which is a mobile and data platform that is designed to actually help uh, the private property owners um, identify um, green infrastructure solutions. And so um, as mentioned in my intro, I am, I am the um, founding principal of Roth Ecological Design. And but this mobile app is actually housed under a new startup called 3R Water. Um, so again, I'm sure this audience is also very well familiar with the issues we're having today. I mean, not only are we you know, impacting, you know, getting the impacts of climate change, but just increased urbanization alone and more and more hard surfaces. Um, it's just leading to the likelihood of more flooding, more pollution in our water, and even impacting our future water supply since that water can no longer get back into the ground. And so again, just to, um, you know, as, as Randall had mentioned, the whole premise is how can we think about the, the pre-development hydrology and think about natural systems and ecosystem services and, and build, rebuild these systems back into the urban spaces. And so green infrastructure includes a whole bunch of things from rainwater harvesting to fire retention, green roofs, permeable pavement, and um, Randall gave a good background on their benefits. And, and as he mentioned, it has a whole host of other benefits other than just um, managing stormwater. So follow the drop really was then about how can we increase that access to these types of solutions to everybody? So, you know, I'm sure a lot of folks in this, in this audience are familiar or maybe designers or engineers of, of such systems or seen them play, but there's many folks out there that just literally have never um, heard of green infrastructure, understand how they contribute to the stormwater runoff problems, um, and so the whole idea behind Follow the Drop was how do we essentially take that knowledge and make an easy to use platform for everybody to be able to identify their own footprints of stormwater and then importantly also be part of the solution to capture it on property. And so um, we work specifically with cities and so we're working with, for example, the city and county of Honolulu and the whole idea too is to modernize their program so that they can really increase and accelerate that community engagement piece. But then importantly, on the, on the back end too, which I'll get into, um, the app actually also helps them be able to track these assets. So this is really important because oftentimes what's happened is these systems get installed. Um, often they will be left um, not maintained. And then of course, and then that they're not gonna be functioning the way that they were intended. So the app will help then um, uh, provide those opportunities to see, uh, to track those projects through the course of its lifetime, as well as collect stormwater metrics, um, track that maintenance, and again, also offer opportunities for uh, customer or with future utility, customer communication and engagement. 
I just want to acknowledge um, kind of a little bit of background. So um, back in, in 2018 and 2019, uh, we originally received funding to kind of move forward with this idea of follow the drop um, with a, a, a grant from the Water Security Advisory Group, which was um, hosted by the Commission of Water Resource Management, as well as the Hawaii Community Foundation. And so we had a whole fantastic group of partners that kind of came together uh, to think about how we can develop this tool and importantly, have it be a great educational uh, resource. So initially when, when it was in development, we really wanted to make sure it was super easy and fun to use. And so we had uh, fifth, fourth and fifth graders piloting it at their campuses. And in the meantime, in partnership with KUPU, uh, we developed a 13 um, lesson plan curriculum that basically teaches about teaches uh, middle school age students about the issues of, of water and, and climate change, but also importantly, get, you know, introducing them to the, the solutions such as green infrastructure. Um, and so they had a great time actually, you know, auditing their campuses with the app, and then importantly, providing us feedback um, to make sure it'd be fun to use for those in the future. And so again, today, um, the app is really then um, being tested and piloted, and I'll get into a little bit with what we're doing with the city, but the whole idea is then how can we support um, bringing in more green infrastructure practices uh, to private properties um, and, and public properties uh, throughout the island. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a walkthrough of how it works. Uh, so basically, um, the administrator would, would be the, someone like the city and county of Honolulu, where they have a license um, to view all of the data that's being entered into the app. And then the user would be, um, for example, anyone within the jurisdiction of the city, so the island of Oahu. So you'd be given a license key under, under the administrator. And then after you register, you essentially log in. And so the Apple then ideally what it's gonna be trying to do is identify opportunities on your property uh, where you can capture stormwater and um, implement green infrastructure solutions. So it'll guide you first to uh, try to identify different drainage devices around your, your home, in, let's say in this case. Um, in this particular one on the left, you'll see um, what's called an open downspout. So the downspout's bringing water down from the roof of this building. And we created these, these icons on the bottom that you can kind of scroll back and forth on in case you know, many folks maybe not, don't, don't understand the terminology, for example, of what some of these drainage devices are called. So they can just select the icon that best matches to what they're looking at. Um, it'll then, then ask them to classify the surrounding area. So looking around that downspout, um, what are the conditions? Is it flat? Is it sloping? Bare soil, pavement? And you begin to select what those conditions are to help then guide what um, uh, practice would be best for that situation. So after that, it'll take you then into a, um, a basically a Google Maps and it'll ask you then to then draw the drainage area. So this is the area, in this case of the building, there was several, um, there were several downspouts that they wanted to collect from to move into a rain garden. So they just tapped on the screen to draw the area of the roof that they wanna capture the stormwater from. And so it's just basically using a simple Google Earth tool and then that drainage, drainage area will then auto-populate there at the bottom. So once that's confirmed, um, it'll then bring in the rainfall data. So we're currently using the Hawaii um, Rainfall Atlas data, um, but we're excited that we've been working with Tom and others to um, bring in the new climate portal data, which will be much more up-to-date. And um, as, I, as I'll get into later, we'll be developing a dashboard that'll give forecasting and also be able to give you real-time stormwater volumes that, that um, this, your projects are capturing. But anyway, in the meantime, what it's doing is, is based on that pinpoint and the geolocation, um, it's bringing in the rainfall data for that particular site. So again, here it's populating at 35 inches of rain per year. And so with those, with the drainage area and those pieces of information, it's then able to populate um, the stormwater runoff volume. So if you look here then on the, on the left-hand side, that tan bar graph is saying that that downspout is producing roughly about 80,000 gallons of stormwater per year. Um, it's pointing at the rainwater catchment and provides them then an optimum or ideal value of a size tank. That would be roughly about a 2,300 gallon tank. Um, but let's say you don't have the size or, or you don't have the space or the money for that size tank. You can enter whatever size you deem feasible. And then the blue bar graph will be animated and tell you approximately how much of that stormwater per year you'd capture based on the size and type system you selected. So again, a 500 gallon tank here is roughly about 15,000 gallons of water um, that's estimated that you'd capture per year. Now on the right-hand side is when, this, if, when the stormwater utility um, gets going, it'll then tell you, it'll estimate the area of impervious area treated or removed, which will then, um, you know, basically is how you'll be billed. 
And then it'll estimate then what your fee credit would be based on the size and type system entered. Um, and so this will become valuable so that you would understand potential financial gain. And so specifically with the rainwater catchment, uh, because currently the Board of Water Supply does have a rebate, we also are looking into adding a button um, with you select a catchment tank that'll link you directly to getting that rebate as well. So then um, and, and use your vote, basically I should maybe step back for a second, but basically at this point, you could either save the project as a draft if you just wanna um, play around with the tool and you're not sure yet how you wanna move forward, um, or you would then eventually be able to submit these projects directly to the city for review uh, to, to eventually um, receive that uh, credit or rebate. So um, it also then has some reviews. So let's say you're an engineer or planner or just someone who has a lot of opportunities on your property. You can take a variety of, of data points and you'll only see your data, um, but you can see it in map view, all the drops representative of the different types of green infrastructure practices. You can see it in chart view. Importantly, you can also see it in list view. Um, and so in list view, you'll be able to then follow along with the status of your project. Um, this history icon button, which you see on the left that's highlighted in red, um, that essentially, it, what you, when you press that, it'll tell you where your project is and the status of, of its lifetime. So essentially when you first submit a project, it, you, would only get, you would only be at the blue checkbox where it says submitted. And then only the city and county would be able to change the status of the project. So after you've submitted it, they'd be able to review your project and then update that status to approved. And it would be time stamped on both ends so you could see um, you know, when, it, when your project was approved. Um, with that, they'll, they'll, you'll receive a notification from them that essentially that, essentially that you would um, have to upload a new photo to verify, for example, that it has been installed to be able to get to that new installed uh, checkbox. And at that point, you'd be considered for that uh, credit or, or rebate. And then importantly too, it's important to keep track of the maintenance. So um, it, it might be annually or every few years, um, the city might decide to send an automatic notification for then a new photo to be up to, up, 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 uh, loaded to, um, to verify that it's still being installed and maintained to maintain that credit uh, status. And so importantly with the city, um, as I mentioned, they'll be able to then to see all of the user's data that's coming in so that they can easily track the locations, the status, um, including you know, when status changes happen, as well as the different volumes of stormwater that, that are being managed um, in these various green stormwater infrastructure practices. And importantly, as I mentioned before, they can also then send these notifications um, to the users to when new photos are needed. It could also be to announce when rain barrel workshops are available or other kind of alerts they might wanna send out to their customers. So I'm just gonna briefly give you an overview of, of what we're currently doing um, with in partnership with uh, both the city and county of Honolulu Department of Facilities Maintenance, as well as Malama Mauna Lua, which is a nonprofit group loca located in um, East Honolulu. And so this was generally our, our overall like scope that we've been working on uh, for the last year and a half or so. Um, I'm really going to just dive into um, how we how we are using the app in a specific watershed. And so basically, what had happened was um, we wanted to identify a priority area that was experiencing not only nuisance flooding, but obviously um, there's pollution issues into um, Malua Bay. And, um, but the other piece to this that was interesting was that this was also, Aina Haina was also a priority watershed um, to the Board of Water Supplies because of the, uh, the, the potential of how the amount of water that the community is, is needing versus the amount of water that is um, in the aquifers in the area. So basically when there's not enough supply um, in this area, Board of Water Supply will then have to pump from the Halaba Shaft or other locations in central Oahu, which increases the cost of operations. Anyway, so we looked at fall a drop to basically think about what would be the benefit if um, all of the 1800 odd properties um, were to implement um, the optimum size green infrastructure because at, at the time we didn't really have an understanding of what would be the impact of, of a program that would support um, green infrastructure going in. So what we did is we were able to use the app remotely and actually go into these um, 1800 odd um, properties that are primarily residential, a few, um, not, a few schools and nonprofits, as well as a, a shopping center there. And so the data was, was interesting because we were able to kind of separate out the data um, you know, in different quadrants based off of um, different rainfall isoheights. So for example, um, and then in just the residential area, we had this upper watershed group of about um, 80 odd homes. 
And the, the app was able to um, provide the following information that um, there was um, 55 inches of rainfall. The average building roof area was roughly 2,500 square feet. And that the total stormwater um, volume uh, just coming off of these homes um, in this one quadrant is about 6.3 million gallons per year. And so what was interesting about that number was that's roughly about 50% of the potable water demand um, that these homes would be needing. So if when this water is really just coming down their driveways into, into a storm sewer, into a stream, and then into an ocean, you're, we're losing, if you will, that storm water and it's creating a problem carrying pollution. So if these properties were then able to capture it and recharge it, that's getting them that, that water back down in that aquifer. Um, and importantly, offering potentially if they do catchment, some alternative supplies. And so we looked at then if they were to implement optimum size green infrastructure, the potential reduction could be about 5.6 million gallons versus only if there was a rain bail program continued, that would only be about 200,000 gallons captured per year. So a pretty big difference. Um, we also then looked at you know, the, the other properties further down the watershed, such as schools and churches and nonprofits. And again, there's less of them, but these building roofs obviously get larger. Um, and so again, you know, we had about 5.7 million gallons of stormwater coming off. Potential volume for, that could be captured with green infrastructure is about 5.2 million gallons. And again, if they only continued with a rain barrel program, a, a much less volume of 360,000 gallons could be captured per year. And then, of course, there's the one shopping center, the Inohana Shopping Center. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of hard surfaces. Um, they're obviously, their stormwater utility bill would also be greatly, um, would be much, much greater because of all the parking lots and building roofs. Um, and you can see that just in this one space, you know, about 17,000 square feet of building roof area, they produce um, about 5.6 million gallons of stormwater. And again, um, have the potential to capture about 90% of that through optimum green infrastructure sizing. And so we just kind of did another kind of just using the chart view comparison, um, looking at this is just an example of the, one of the residential quadrants. Um, the tan representing um, stormwater runoff volumes from the different properties. The numbers and below are the tax map keys of each of the properties. Um, and the blue representing the potential for stormwater capture. So obviously when it's a um, rain barrel, um, we estimated that to be about 50 gallons. Um, and then if, um, if it's optimum size green infrastructure, you know, they'd be capturing 90% of that stormwater runoff on average. So we are also then, the data is also able to be exported into a CSV file where we can then just easily summarize um, the data collected. And this was important just because we wanted to just see what the current conditions um, are and then what the potential could be for reduction of stormwater runoff. And then importantly then, what percentage of people or, or types of properties would, would need to implement green infrastructure to make any kind of significant dent. And so the, really the numbers that I want you to kind of hone in on are you know, the total on average runoff volume um, for Aina Haina was roughly about 18 million gallons. And about, um, I believe that's around 85% or 90% of that coming from the residential community. So, you know, and this is pretty common, not only uh, for Aina Haina, but across the island that really the bulk of stormwater runoff is coming uh, from residential communities. Um, but importantly, the commercial facilities that are quite large and have a lot of, of, of you know, concrete and hardscapes do contribute um, quite a bit of that runoff, as well as um, other the schools and nonprofits. But again, uh, we're, you know, if, if everyone were to implement uh, this optimum size green infrastructure, we could have a pretty significant dent in terms of improving uh, water quality and getting that water back into the ground. So again, about 90% potential capture rate about 100 um, million gallons per year. And if they only continue to push out a, a rain barrel program, um, then we would have a, only about a 3% uh, capture rate or recharge ability um, to you know, capture that volume. So again, um, this data is then being used um, in correlation to when, uh, with our, our partnership with Maloma Manalua. Um, but also what we're doing with the city then is also looking at updates to the app while we're doing this pilot with um, Maloma Manalua to be able to, to test new um, uh, features and products that we're, um, that we're offering. So mostly the main thing is we want to try to align the app with the city program and also continue to add um, different types of green stormwater infrastructure practices that are in line with what Randall mentioned in the city design standards. Um, and then also uh, working on how we can integrate the border water supply rebate program. Importantly, we're also doing some fun um, dashboard development 
which we hope will come out soon. And it'll basically be a way for the users to be able to um, monitor how much stormwater they're capturing, as well as the money that they're saving. We'd also have some forecast data to alert when storms are coming to, for example, prepare their um, rain tanks uh, to drop down the, the level so it can capture the volume and um, other types of features like that. Um, so with that, um, Malama Mauna Lua has basically um, set up a page called uh, uh, rainwaterhawaii.com and basically are offering free rainwater assessments um, from the Kahala to Hawaii Kai area and what they'll be, what they're able to do is come in uh, by appointment coming in, into these properties um, using the app and working with the property owners um, they can help identify the stormwater runoff footprint that these properties have and importantly help size and identify locations uh, where these um, different types of green infrastructure practices can go and then with that, they're actually then surveying uh, the community to see, um, you know, would the property owner install these projects that are being recommended with or without an additional incentive? And, um, and this information is really important so that we can help bring that back um, to the city to you know, help maybe engage what might be needed uh, to get uh, property owners to actually implement these projects. And as another carrot to this, um, if when you get your property owner, when you get your property assessed, you'll be entered to win a free rain barrel. Um, one will be draw, drawn the end of the summer and one, another one at the end of the year. If you know anyone in the area, please have them um, sign up. Um, they're certainly um, looking for more houses to, to participate. And then lastly, they're, they're going out into the community in different, um, different types of, of community events. And then for those that they can't hit, they um, will actually audit their properties remotely and walk them through the process and also get feedback um, from community members in different locations. And um, really at the end of the day, I think really the future of, of stormwater as, as we're titled in our talk is really how can we create more access to these green infrastructure solutions and really start envisioning what our city could look like um, in terms of you know, normalizing um, stormwater management across all properties. So I'll end there and um, open up to any questions. Great. Um, thank you so much to both of our speakers. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment, but everyone feel free to answer them at this time. Um, while we're waiting for the chat, I kind of had a question about um, the stormwater capture. Um, so there would obviously need to be some kind of treatment done for it to be you know, usable for a lot of human purposes. So like, what would people, re how would people repurpose it? Or is it mostly just to put it back into the aquifer? Like they're just kind of, you know, you capture it and putting it, trying to get it back into the, the ground itself. I can answer that question. Um, well, stormwater is going to have different qualities depending on where it comes from. Um, so if you're capturing um, it off of your roof, that's generally going to be a pretty relatively clean supply. Although, you know, in between rain events, you will get sort of dustings of, of bird poop and other debris. So oftentimes what you'll have is what's called a first flush device. Um, and then after that, it'll then um, go into your rain tank. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I mean, we definitely wouldn't, uh, we're not recommending consumption of the water itself, uh, but, you know, I know that there's different ideas that people can come up with. Like, of course, the most obvious is being able to use it for um, irrigating your lawn and you know, plants that can be used after the rain event has occurred and then being able to store it for a period of time and then using it after, you know, so that's one way other things that you know has been talked about is using it for when washing your vehicle for instance you know if having to use that as a, a potable water source you know something that could be used for that purpose and i think we've even heard from some folks that you know they've you know are thinking about being able to reuse that water for like toilet flushings if there's a way to kind of somehow connect it to your um your plumbing and be 
being able to use it as um, flushing of your toilets. Uh, more commercial and bigger properties that we've seen where they've actually used large um, capacity type um, cisterns and storage tanks where they've actually used that to store water and use it for that type of purpose, uh, whether for decorative ponds, but also for toilet flushings and things like that. Thanks. Um, okay, we got a couple of chat questions now. Um, so first one from Dolan Eversol says, great presentation to both speakers. I'm curious how these green infrastructure efforts would be giving credit for an eventual stormwater fee. No, well, thank you so much for that question, Dolan. And, and you know, for any type of um, green infrastructure or anything that where allows water to flow into the ground. Uh, what we proposed is that as part of the utility, if it were to be established, is that somebody could get upwards of 60% of a reduction in their fee. Um, it's all depending on the amount of impervious area that you're reducing and capturing that water. And we base it upon under the city's water quality rules, we use a design storm of one inch. Um, so that's the ad. You know, for most of our, the island of Oahu, the average annual um, is about one inch, for, uh, the one inch storm. So designing some kind of capture system or bio retention to be able to store and um, filter that one inch of stormwater, that would potentially qualify for upwards of 60% of the total fee. Okay, uh, next one, John Ford says, I was happy to see so many green infrastructure initiatives already in place or being installed on Oahu. Is either the county or the state mapping these features and their specifications as they're constructed? And if so, would these maps be made available to the public online? No, yeah, thank you so much for that. Excellent question as well. Um, so one way is, you know, you can see with Lauren Roth's um, um, Follow the Drop app, that's um, another way that we can get sort of the um, uh, location and installations of this different types of green infrastructure. I think what we're doing is with the follow the drop, we're definitely focusing on residential properties initially, uh, but it could also add on larger properties like commercial and industrial, other larger developments that could be added as well. But in a lot of those cases um, for larger properties, especially those that are over one acre in uh, ground disturbance is that the city has has what is referred to as this rules relating to water quality. Whenever any of these developers, designers apply for grading, trenching, building, you know, stockpiling type of permit. And within that, if it does exceed those thresholds that they have to come up with actual designs and plans that would demonstrate what type of those type of installations are. And that information then comes over to the city. Um, and what we know at our Department of Planning and Permitting, they have a database that tracks all that type of um, proposed installations. And then once it's been constructed, it gets turned over to our Department of Facility Maintenance, where we perform the uh, follow-up inspections to ensure that these property owners are maintaining them. Uh, when we get that information, we enter it into what is a, a program that we call CityWorks. It's a sort of like an, it's an asset management type of database uh, kind of like a work order system where we can generate work orders for doing our inspections. Uh, but that also ties directly to the GIS system. And so that does have it all mapped out. And our plan is to become make it more accessible to the public. Uh, right now, it's more internal because, of course, how we go about doing our inspections. But with the utility, we've always talked about being more transparent. So we do definitely want to make it more uh, available for the public as well. Great. Um... Donna Wong says, uh, what penalties are being considered to deter people from hardening their property? So penalties, um, well, in a way, what we're doing is we're more focusing on the incentives in order to encourage people to reduce the amount of hard surfaces on their properties. Um, I know that in the city, of course, they do have certain ordinances and laws that um, maybe put a certain cap on the total amount of that impervious area. But if somebody were to go um, up to that point, we can't necessarily say that you have to take it all out if it's in accordance to all the current laws and ordinances. Uh, but with the utility, because it's based on that you know, impervious area, then in a way it de-incentivizes 
by you know putting in all that hard structures. And so the more hard structures and pavement that you have, the more you would end up paying uh, versus somebody who has landscaping. You know, so in that way, they could also qualify for certain type of credits as well. Um, so you know, we're kind of looking at it on that side um, in terms of how we deter people from putting in those type of um, you know hard surfaces. Uh, we are looking at different alternatives uh, with the utility. We've seen in other parts of the country where they've actually uh, put on certain things like, um, you know, uh, it's like a, a surcharge that's add on, added on, on to the actual base rate. So everybody pays a certain base rate based on the total amount of impervious area. But if you exceed a certain threshold, depending on maybe it's because it's based on the livable space, you know, um, this is where it starts to look at other properties that would be considered highly developed, there could be a surcharge that could be added on. You know, so those are things that could maybe be phased in in a later date. You know, we've looked at the different alternatives and seeing what those calculated costs are. Uh, but those are other ways that we could maybe de um, sort of deter from having to have much more impervious areas on the property. Okay, I see three more questions in the chat and I think we'll cut it off after those. Um, so Dennis Peters says, has there been any concern from HDOH about mingling non-stormwater sources, such as people washing vehicles on their property with stormwater in these green infrastructure stormwater capture systems that may infiltrate to groundwater? Or do none of these solutions allow for infiltration to groundwater? So we do not see, we've not heard that um, those type of um, concerns from the state. I think they do encourage that people do if let's say they are using rainwater to wash their vehicles and especially if they're doing it on their properties and capturing it and allowing water to flow into the ground. Um, that's actually a best management practice that we encourage homeowners to do is whenever you're washing your property, especially if you're using any kind of maybe non-biodegradable or biodegradable type of soaps and detergents, is if you can direct that into some kind of landscaped area, then at least there's some way to kind of intercept it, filter it naturally, rather than it just going directly into the storm drains, right? When it's gonna all eventually go out into the streams and oceans. So it's, it's you know, in our, um, the city, as well as in the state, it's actually considered as a best management practice. You know, so I think that's why we do encourage people to actually try to see how they can get water, more water into the ground and, you know, containing it within their properties. I hope that answers your question. Dennis? I could just add to that. I, that normally um, Department of Health kind of gets in when it, when it relates to injection of that kind of polluted water into the ground, moreover, like, versus putting it into a, a landscape that would help filter it before it absorbs into the ground. Okay, um, Michael Wong says, based on the tier one rate, how much money is estimated to be billed or received for the utility? Uh, thanks, Mike, for that question. Um, right now, for a typical um, single family home, this is more like actually like in a tier three kind of thing situation, tier three or four, where there's about 3,900 square feet of impervious area. We've determined that it would range between about 1950 to about $23 per month for a single family home. For the tier one, then it would be basically around... Um, roughly around $5.80 to $6.70, I think it's what I was showing, or six eighty, dollars um, And that would be the for the very smallest properties, right, where they have less than 1,000 square feet of impervious area. Uh, but even on top of that is that that hardship provision we were talking about would be that it would actually reduce that by cut it in half if they qualify under that light heat program where it would actually be paying somewhere around $2.50 per month for those smaller type properties. Okay, and the last question from uh, Diane Vitanage. Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, are there any guidelines to construct rain gardens in residential properties to reduce runoff from the property? Oh, thanks, Diane. Uh, so we do have, I mentioned on our website, we do have a homeowner's guide um, that allows for, you know, more quick and easy to implement things on their property. And then also even to do the testing, like a infiltration type of test where they dig a little 
hole in the ground, fill it up with water and time it to see how long it takes to drain to, you know, to at least determine if it's feasible and allows for any type of rain garden installation. Um, and then from there, we, what we do is we provide some of that, those sort of step-by-step -step instructions as part of the homeowner's guide. Um, we're hoping that with a utility, then there could even be opportunities for like small grants where we could actually prepare um, you know, folks that, especially for those that may not have the means to install it, whether because they just don't have that type of abilities or maybe it's a financial situation or even if it's in a location that we're trying to encourage more in, um, green infrastructure, we would try to establish a small grants program where we could actually cover the cost for the installation and bring somebody from outside a contractor, for instance, to come in and install the green infrastructure for that homeowner if they qualify. Uh, so we've seen that in other communities that have established a stormwater utility because being able to leverage their funding and be able to then use it to directly benefit homeowners and other residential properties. All right, uh, that's it for questions. So just wanted to give one last big thank you to our speakers for joining us in our ser seminar series. And also kind of saying thank you as a whole to everyone who has joined us um, for this semester, um, both our past speakers and the audience who's tuned in every couple weeks as well. I want to say thank you to everyone. Um, glad you could join us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.